Okay, I'm back. All right, I'm ruining off my cell phone again. I hope everyone can hear me. This time it was um, not Cox, it was um, Zoom. All right. Sounds better now. Okay, thank you, Skyler. All right. So, as we were talking and so rudely interrupted by Zoom, <laughs> is this types of uh, solutions. Uh, we can have gas in the liquid, much like I ate carbonated soda. We're all familiar with that. Okay, so that is solution where the solute here is the gas. Obviously, the liquid, most of the time, is an aqueous system, is the solvent. We can have a liquid in the liquid solution, a mixed drink, for example, is a classic example of a solution. Or we can take a solid and put it into liquids, preferably a solid that dissolves in a solution, like a salt, a soluble salt. So we make a salt solution. Okay, uh, gas in the gas where uh, uh, the air itself is the solvent and then all the different gases, nitrogen, oxygen, and all the different traces make up the, uh, the uh, solute. Then we have solid and solid. Most people don't think of this as a solution, but it, it really is because the if we have steel, steel is not uh, pure iron, steel is a mixture of iron and some, and some carbon. That carbon allows, it gives, gives that material iron different properties, but stronger properties. Other examples would be like copper. Copper we utilize in our piping is not pure copper. It is an alloyed. That's what an alloyed is. It's a mixture of different uh, materials in there to give it strength. Uh, brass, for example, is a mixture of zinc and copper and so forth. So solid and solid, another example. Now, the basic rule about this, and it, it's really, it goes back to polarity, okay? We introduced that concept a while back. Polar molecules will dissolve in polar solvents. Another way, say that light dissolves light. So polar solutes will dissolve in polar solvents due to the polarity. In converse to that, is nonpolar solutes dissolve in nonpolar solids. Classic example, oil and water. We know that oil and water do not mix, okay? Italian dressing does not mix. You let it sit and get it, it separates. You have an oil layer and an aqueous layer, okay? And because of differences in polarity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now we know that polar and non and nonpolar materials do not mix. Classic example is the, the oil and water picture that you see. Now, when two liquids mix, we we say that they are miscible. Okay, um, not soluble. We call it miscible. When they do not mix, like oil and water, they are it is said to be immiscible. Okay, when we're dealing with two liquids. When we're dealing with solids in liquids, we use the term either soluble or insoluble. If a solid dissolves in a solution, then it's soluble. If it does not dissolve, then it's classified as insoluble. And so we recall the solubility rules with respect to ionic compounds, and we were dealing with the water solvent, okay? Now, but not, not all solvents are water. Keep that in mind. All right. so. <clears throat> you, excuse me, you may get a table like this and you'll be asked, will these solutes dissolve in these solids? And the first column lists the solvents. Well, we have NH3, which if you don't know it by now, it's ammonia, okay? Uh, C12H26, okay? You may not know what that is, that's okay. But you recognize, two, uh, you recognize that you see nothing but carbon and hydrogen which then should tell you I have a hydrocarbon, which then should tell you I have a nonpolar solvent. 
And then we have Br2, bromine, which is one of the diatomic elements that is di diatomic, guess what? It is nonpolar. So we have to define the polarity of this material. And so we know that ammonia is polar. We went through the Lewis style structures there. A while back, we found a lone pair on nitrogen, okay? That right there tells me I got a polar molecule. C12H26, nonpolar, made up of nothing but carbon and hydrogen. It's a hydrocarbon. You can remember the electronegativity of carbon and hydrogen are essentially the same. Therefore, they have equal electronegativity, they have equal pulling. Therefore, the carbon-hydrogen bond is a nonpolar bond. And then Br2, it's diatomic, automatically, it's a nonpolar species. So those are our solvents. We have to define the polarity of them first. Then we go across the top with HCl, hydrochloric acid, one that we talked about at length. It has a permanent dipole, okay? It is, ve it is very polar. And so the solute is polar. Iodine, again, diatomic, so nonpolar. And then we have PCL3. Well, if we go through the Lewis dot structure, it would have very similar structure as NH3 ammonia with a lone parasite on phosphorus, telling us that we have a polar bond here, okay? Plus we have three uh, polar bonds. And then again here with, solute, with CH4, hydrocarbon, again, nonpolar. And so before we can fill up the table to determine whether it dissolve or no, we have to first determine the polarity of both the solvent and the solute. Once we do that, then we know, like we remember, like dissolves like. And so the answer for the first one, and that is hydrochloric acid in ammonia, the answer would be yes, because of their respective polarity. It would be no for iodine because iodine is a nonpolar species and it would not dissolve very well in uh, ammonia. Uh, Trichlor phosphorus trichloride, definitely yes, because both of them are polar species. And then no for CH4, which is methane. Methane, uh, because methane is nonpolar and ammonia is polar. So once we're done with that, we can go across and do the rest of them. No for uh, H. CL in the hydrocarbon, C12H26. Again, uh, because of differences in polarity. And for iodine, that would be yes, because both of them are nonpolar. No for PCL3, because polarity differences again. And yes for NH, uh, CH4, methane. Again, because the polarity is similar. And then finally, no for HCl and bromine, again, because of polarity differences, yes for iodine, no for PCL3, and yes for CH4. So that's how we determine whether a, sol a solute is soluble in a solvent. Uh, we first have to determine the polarity of the molecule, okay? not the polarity of the bonds, because remember that will determine whether a molecule that has polar bonds, uh, let me restate that. To refresh your memory. If a, if a molecule has all nonpolar bonds, automatically nonpolar, okay? Now, if a molecule has polar bonds, we can say most of the time it is a polar molecule, unless, unless the polar bonds cancel each other out, okay? Such as the case in carbon dioxide, where the polar bonds of carbon and hydrogen each go in opposite direction and therefore cancel each other out, resulting in a nonpolar molecule. All right, with respect to miscible, immiscible, soluble, insoluble, remember miscible, immiscible, immiscible are dealing with liquids, with liquid solute, liquid solvent, uh, soluble, insoluble deal with solids and solvent, liquid solvents. Okay, so we got a polar liquid and a polar solvent, then we have a miscible solution. They're both miscible because they dissolve. 
Inmissible if it's a nonpolar salt. With respect to nonpolar liquid, inmissible when you have a polar solvent, and miscible when you have a nonpolar solvent. You have a polar so solid, okay? Polar solvent, okay? Soluble. So HCl will dissolve in water. HCl, hydrochloric acid, is very soluble. Okay, very, uh, it's very polar, I should say. Water obviously is polar. However, if we try to put it into, say, oil, like vegetable oil, it won't dissolve because, again, the differences in polarity in the, in the vegetable oil would re, re, be representative of a nonpolar solvent. If we have a uh, nonpolar solid, okay, such as, I don't know, chunk of butter. Put it in water, see what happens. It won't dissolve, right? Because the butter is very, very nonpolar, nonpolar solid. Okay. And even if you heated the butter up in the water, you're still going to have uh, softened butter liquid and it's going to separate because it's oil like with respect to the, to the butter. So you have a separation of the two. Okay, but if I take that butter and I kind of mix it up and say vegetable oil, it will go in solution because again, the polarity similarities on both the solvent and the solid. With respect to ionic solids, well, that depends on the solubility rules. Not all ionic compounds are soluble in water, for example. We know that because of the solubility rules. There's degrees of solubility. Now, with respect to ionic solid and, and nonpolar solid, totally insoluble. Try this out at home. You got a little table salt, throw some uh, in a pan. You're going to heat up some eggs or put a little oil or something in the pan. That sodium chloride will not dissolve. Sodium chloride is very ionic, very polar. Okay. So uh, we talked about earlier about the solvating, the dissolving process. We're basically, uh, with respect to ionic compounds, the water molecules and their polarity and their, their dipole of the partial negative and the partial positive on the hydrogen, partial negative on the oxygens. Here you can see an example where the sodium is solvated by the oxygens of the water molecule. And if we were doing, say, sodium chloride, table salt, the chlorides will be over here with a negative charge, and there'll be interaction here, okay? This type of scenario. And, you know, think of it in three-dimensional. You know, I'm just showing you here in two-dimensional. So that's how we, how uh, uh, ion compounds get solvated by, specifically by water here. All right, which brings us to concentration. We mentioned on that earlier, we have two, two measures of concentration. One is called a mass percent, okay? Which is basically the weight of the solute divided by the total weight of the solvent and the solute. We're gonna have a specific example here in a bit. And then we have molarity. Molarity is also a concentration uh, recall when we were talking about pH, the pH of the hydrogen ion concentration, we had a bracket around the proton of H plus. At that time, I introduced the concept of molarity, which has the units of moles per liter. Okay. And so we, we've gone through calculating moles because um, recall that to calculate moles, we need the molar mass or the atomic weight, depending on what, what the material is. And then uh, that amount in grams is converted to moles. We calculate the number of moles and we divide it by the volume that that amount is dissolved. And it, it needs to be in liters, okay? So moles per liters is molarity. Let's take a look at mass, mass percent, okay? Um, there's a lot of things out there in, in the market and everyday life that uh, you may see a percentage. A classic example, but it's not a mass mass, is the uh, the alcohol content of wine and beer 
And norm but normally that's a mass volume or it could be a volume, volume, it depends. But in this case, we're gonna talk about mass, mass. So what we need is the mass of the solute divided by the mass of the solution. Remember, the mass of the solution is the mass of the solvent plus the mass of the solute. So for this example here, if you take 15 grams of potassium nitrate, okay? We're not too concerned about the formula here because the formula has no factor. All we're telling you is that we're taking 15 grams of potassium nitrate and we are going to dissolve it in 135 grams of water. And that's it. Okay. Now, if we were going to calculate the molarity, guess what? Then we would need the formula of potassium nitrate to give us a molar mass, which then we can use to calculate the moles. Okay. But we're not. We're just dealing with mass and mass. So we're not too concerned about anything dealing with potassium nitrate other than it's 15 grams of it. So to set that up, we take 15 grams and we divide it by the total 15 grams and 135 grams, okay? And we multiply, by, by, multiply that by 100 and we have this solution is a 10% solution. Uh, those of you in the nursing field, you may be familiar or are familiar with 0.9% saline solution. Anybody know what that is when they say saline? Ever heard of that term? Saline is a sodium chloride solution. And that is a 0.9% solution. We're going to do some calculations here how to determine how, how can we calculate uh, the amount of water. Here in this case, we gave you the quantity of the water. We gave you the quantity of the solute, which is 15 grams, and we calculate the mass percent. But occasionally, yeah. So the idea that is correct, but specifically the salt is sodium chloride. You know, sodium chloride, the saline. Um, let me clear this up a little bit here. And so you may need to calculate, for example, um, how much water you need to make a 5% saline solution and that has 10 grams of water, okay? And so if you ever need to make that into a 0.9% solution, you just change that 5% to 0 0.5 grams and you'll be able to calculate that. That saline solution is very specific because uh, if you don't, if you use this pure water, that plays havoc on your, pure, on your cells in your body. <laughs> so, the saline solution is kind of equates the uh, osmotic pressure between the cells in your body and you don't either blow them up or shrink them up, okay? All right, so what do we do here? Well, we set up a problem. What we don't know is what we're gonna define as X. And I've written here, it's very uh, simple. It looks complicated, but it really isn't complicated algebraic equation. We don't know what X is because that is the amount of water that we need, okay? We do, we do know the solute, which is 10 grams, okay? We know the percentage, which is 5.00%. And so we can set the problem up like we would as defined right here, where we have the mass of the solute plus the mass of the solution is equal to 100 times 100 grams equals to the percent, okay? So we don't know the grams of solvent and that's what we define as X. So we got this algebraic equation. Now there's multiple ways to solve for X here. This is just one way. And one way here is to multiply both sides by the quantity of 10 plus X, all right? And so if I were to 
multiply everything by 10 plus x here and 10 plus 10 zero plus x on this side. This cancels out right here and I end up with this scenario. See how we got there? By multiplying both sides by 10 plus x. So from this point, you can do a multiple ways. You can uh, spread out the go five times 10, five times x. You can do that 10 times 100, any multiple ways, but they just follow that. We multiply 10 times 100, it gives us 1,000. Okay, now at this point, uh, we can bring the five over if you like. There's a couple of ways, like I said, you can do this. No one way is correct. We can distribute this factor here if we want, okay? Giving us uh, uh, 50 plus 5x equal 1,000 and solve for x, or we can divide through by five around and to give us this scenario. So if you divide through by five, now we got 10 plus x is equal to 1,000 by five, divided by five. Okay, see how that was done? Everything was divided by five. Okay, things cancel right there. All right, and you get that scenario. All right, just clear that up a little bit. Now, you take 1,000 divided, divided by five, that gives you 200. Now you got 10 plus X. I wanna isolate X. Subtract 10 from both sides and I end up with X is equal to 190. Now I put it into scientific notation because of the sig figs that I started off with, okay? Pretty sig figs. So I can't write 190 and three sig figs. So I have to put it into scientific notation. Well, how do I know that 190 is the correct answer? Well. What you do is just stick it back in the equation. You take that 190 that you just calculated and plug it back in there and you should end up with, run the math on the right side, you should end up with 5.0 equals 5.0. And it does in this scenario. So that means that that 190 is correct, okay? So what does that mean is, that if I take 10 grams of salt, it doesn't make a difference what type of salt. Remember, when we talk about salt in chemistry, it's any ionic compound. So we take 10 grams of salt, dissolve it in 190 grams of water, we have a 10% solution. Okay. All right. So that's the solution. Now, with respect to molarity. Another factor, another uh, uh, term used in concentration, okay? By definition, molarity is defined as the moles of solute divided by the volume of solution in liters, in liters. So, if you take, I want you to calculate the molarity of 9.99 grams of potassium bromide, and if you dissolve it in 2.5 liters of solution, what is the molarity? Well, what we need, since we're calculating the molarity, the first thing we need is obviously the formula, okay? We need the formula of potassium bromide. So we need to put it together. So my recommendation is always when trying to put a formula together, specifically ionic compounds, is to first write them in ionic form. We know potassium is in group one. When it becomes an ion, it will have a plus one charge. And we know that bromide is in group seven. And when it becomes ionic, it will pick up, it's a non-metal, it will pick up one electron to give us a net, um, negative one charge. So now that I have the charge in them, I can put them together with a, a with the correct formula. So in this case, it's a simply one to one. So it's simply KBR, okay? Um, I look up the, the uh, atomic 
weight for bromide, which is 79.90. Okay, I'm looking that up. And 39.104 for um, potassium. 18, 19, 10, 11. So that's 191 grams per mole, the atomic weight. So I'm going to the molar mass now. Okay, because I need that because I need to convert the number of grams of potassium, 9.99 grams, into moles. And so the first step is. Take the molar mass of potassium bromide, which now I know because I, I wrote the formula correctly. It's one to one, one potassium, one bromide is 119 grams per mole. I take the weight of potassium bromide divided by the molar mass. That gives me the um, number of moles. And I just, I leave all the numbers because I, don't want to truncate anything until I'm done because I start off with three sig figs, 9.99. I'm going to divide eventually by uh, uh, 2.50. Okay, the value of 9.99, I carry it through. And then I divide it by 2.50. And <clears throat> excuse me, the molarity for this solution is uh, 0 0.03. 336 moles per liter. That is the molarity of this solution if I took 9.99 grams of potassium bromide and I dissolved it in uh, two and a half liters of solution. Okay. All right. Now, on the, uh, there's questions obviously in the textbook. You want to knock that out. And of course, there's more worksheet problems for you. You work these type of uh, problems out for you uh, the, in the worksheets. Okay. So, yeah, do the worksheets. They give you more practice with respect to these type of problems. And let's do one, one more. Okay. Calculate the molarity. If you take 5.0, zero grams of sodium phosphate is dissolved in water to make 255 milliliters of solution. Okay. Now, keep in mind, if you forget, write down what you're doing here. I want to eventually get to molarity, which is capital M, and it has moles per liter are the units. Okay. Note something. The solution is 255 milliliters. So I'm going to need a conversion factor for that, right? Recall that in one liter is equal to a thousand milliliters. So I can use that to convert my milliliters to liters. Or I can recognize I simply move the decimal point over three, three decimal places to the left and I'm good to go. But if you don't recognize that, Go back and you know use that that conversion factor. All right, now we have five grams of sodium phosphate. Uh, we need to write the correct formula. All right, so we know, like I stated, put everything in ionic form. Sodium is in group one. Sodium will have a plus one charge when it becomes ionic. The phosphate, not to be confused with phosphide. Phosphide will be simply the phosphorus by itself. The ATE or the ITE is an indication to send you to the polyatomic ion table. And if you look that up, you'll see that the formula for phosphate is PO4 negative 3. Okay? PO4 negative 3. That is the phosphate. Now it tells me that I need three sodium ions to cancel out the negative three of the phosphate. So the formula for sodium phosphate is Na3PO4, okay? And I need that bit of information, why? Because I want the molar mass. I got four, four hydrogens, one phosphorus, and three sodiums. I add those up, that gives me the molar mass. 
Why do I need the molar mass? Because I need to convert five grams to moles. Okay, we're back to moles again. Okay, we need to convert that to moles. And in order to do that, I need the molar mass of the compound. And in order to get the molar mass, I need to make sure that uh, I get the correct formula. All right, so I got all the bits of information that I need. I, write, I wrote them down so I know what I need. So I can start with, uh, let me clear this up. Okay. And so the molar mass of sodium phosphate is 163.94 grams. Okay. That is for three sodiums, one phosphorus, and four oxygen. Total is 163.94 grams per mole. I'm given 5.0 grams of sodium phosphate. I divide by the molar mass. Okay. Check my units here. My grams cancel, leaving me with moles. And that is the number of, mo number of moles of sodium phosphate for that number of grams. Now I take my 255 milliliters and I convert that to liters. Okay, because I know that in one liter, there are a thousand milliliters. So I can set up the conversion factor with milliliters to denominator because I want those to cancel. I want the units of milliliters to cancel just like I did up here with grams. Grams cancel down here. Milliliters cancel. So the units I'm left over with is moles and liters, which by the way is molarity by definition. Okay. All right, so now I just plug in the numbers and uh, keeping track of my sig figs. Remember, I start off with 5.0 grams. So now I'm eventually dividing by 255. So I might have to end up with two sig figs. Therefore, my number is 0 0.19 moles per liter. Okay. And <clears throat> So if I take five grams of sodium phosphate and I dissolve it in 255 milliliters of solution, the molarity of that solution is 12, uh, 0.12 moles per liter. Okay. All right. Turn this up a little bit. All right, what, well, ladies and gentlemen, guess what? Chapter 15 is complete. Don't forget, obviously, don't forget the, uh, the uh, assignments. Uh, there is, uh, if you look at the module for um, the final exam, there is a final exam practice exam for you. So um, we're not quite done yet. I got one more chapter. <laughs> at, at, at GCC, they only go up to chapter 15 for a different reason. Here at SEC, we got to go through one more chapter. So anyway, tell you what, let's take a quick um, short uh, break. Um, and I can do one or two things. I can continue with chapter 16, which is like eight slides, I think, eight, nine slides, very short. Or I can open it up for uh, any questions that you may have over in the, in the assignments do so far. Okay. So think about it. Okay. And let's come back at, say, uh, two o'clock. All right. All right. Let me pause. All righty, welcome back. Didn't lose too many of you. <laughs> okay, well, here's, if you don't have any questions about what we've done, I, I will continue with chapter 16. We'll be done with it way before our time. That'll be good. That'll be good. Then uh, what I'll do is for next, I'll send an email to this effect uh, next Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, obviously we won't have any more lecture. But I will still be here uh, for you so you can uh, come in with questions and we can go over them. If you don't have any questions, 
you know, uh, good luck to you. Uh, you finish your uh, assignments and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. All right. So no questions. All right. All right, well, this brings us to the final chapter, dealing with gases. Now, remember uh, when we were dealing, we dealt with uh, gases, moles and gases, and we said at STP, standard temperature and pressure, that only uh, under those conditions would uh, you can state that one mole would occupy a volume of 22.4 liters, okay? And that was true for when you are at STP, but we're gonna introduce an equation here where you can calculate the volume other, at different temperatures other than, and pressures other than STP, okay? So let's go over a little bit about pressure. Well, what exactly is pressure? Um, and that is defined as the force per unit area, okay? that is exerted by gas molecules that are colliding against the walls of inside of a container. Okay, now the pressure increases if the number of collisions increase. Classic, good example of this would be your tires in your vehicle. You start off in the morning, car is nice and cool, when relatively cool given the Arizona heat, but it's got a set temperature uh, I mean, uh, set pressure in your tire. And let's assume it's 32 PSI, okay? So you drive for about an hour. And as you're driving, you're picking up friction from the tires. That's what gives, what heats up those tires because of the friction. No friction, no movement. <laughs> you wouldn't be, get, be able to get from point A to point B. Nevertheless, temperature of your tires increase, okay? Which the molecules, the air molecules in the air tire get uh, uh, excited because there's more energy. And if you were to stop and, and measure the pressure, your pressure would be much greater than which is starting off at 32. Now, mind you, you did not add any more air. All you did was heat up the tire. The molecules picked up the, the energy. They moved around greater, much more uh, than they were earlier and the pressure goes up, okay? And that's what we mean by the energy of the collisions increase. Now, um, there is no pressure in a vacuum, obviously, because there's no air molecules, anything in a, in a vacuum. In fact, there's no sound in a vacuum because again, sound is, is, is gets from point A to point B through the air molecules in our atmosphere. Now, um, Atmospheric pressure, and that is that is the force of air that's hitting us. And you'll be surprised the amount of pressure that is really on us that we don't feel at all. But it's a it's a large amount of money, amount of money, a large amount of pressure. Do a simple calculation just in this one square meter area that you're sitting at right now. That is one square, one square by one square. That's that's one square you know, unit, or it's an area, right? Now, multiply that by go up to 10,000 meters up in the air. So now you got a cylinder that's one meter by one meter, and that's where you're sitting, and you go up 10,000. So what is the volume of that? One times one times 10,000, you have 10,000 cubic meters, okay, of air hitting on you. Now, as a rough estimate, you have, let's assume that the density of the air is, you know, in the same units, uh, uh, one, one kilogram per unit. What does that mean? That there are 10,000 kilograms of air pressed on you. That's a lot of pressure. And you might think, well, wait a minute, how come I'm not squashed like a pancake? No. That's because this is the way humans have evolved to survive this pressure by putting an equal and opposite amount of pressure inside your body. So if there's 10,000 pounds of pressure on me internally, 
there's 10,000 pressures of pressure uh, going in the opposite direction to counter that. And that's why animals down there are four, three thousand, three, four thousand feet under the ocean can survive. Uh, we can't, but they certainly can. And because the amount of pressure that they exert inside their bodies is that's how they evolve and they can survive that because they're exerting that amount of pressure outside counter the pressure that they're being exhibited hitting that they are, they are having the amount of pressure on them. I'll get it straight here. Okay, so that's a lot of air pressure that's hitting us. We, we don't feel it. And honestly, as you go up higher in the atmosphere, there's less uh, pressure simply because there's less air. You know? That's it, less dense. Now, how do we measure pressure? We talked about one atmosphere. Well, normally there's, there's, there's an instrument called a barometer. Okay, it's a real simple instrument. And it's basically mercury in this tube, test tube, if you will, that's upside down. So uh, the atmospheric pressure denoted by the arrow pushes down on the mercury and then pushes it up the test tube. Now, this test tube will have a scale in metric units from one to, seven, say, 760 millimeters. So that scale that is marking up here at 760, that would be considered, let's say, one atmosphere right here. Let me draw that. Right there, it's one atmosphere. So we will have a scale sitting here from zero to 760. Now, as the pressure, atmospheric pressure fluctuates, and we all know we are here in the weather, high pressure, low pressure, that mercury goes up and down. Okay, so we have a different amount of pressure. So when everything, our reference point is one atmosphere, which is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury or 29.92 inches of mercury. Okay, now they use mercury because it's, it's a very dense metal, obviously. And if we can make a barometer out of water, however, it has to be about 30, 32 feet long because of the density of water. So it's not a very practical barometer. So mercury works out pretty good. Uh, so what we have here is units that one atmosphere is equal to uh, 760 millimeters of mercury or 29.92 inches of mercury. And that can be converted to pounds per square inch as PSI. Those are the English units. 400, uh, excuse me, 14.7 pounds per square inch is equal to 760 millimeters. There's another unit of pressure called TOR, T-O-R-R, which is e equivalent to millimeters of mercury. So 760 TOR is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. And all of that is all equal to one atmosphere. So to rehack. One atmosphere of pressure is equal to 760 torr, which is equal to the same as 760 millimeters of mercury or 29 point, uh, right here, 29.92 mil, uh, inches, okay? And that is equal to 4.7 PSI. So we've had a bunch of conversion factors here you can utilize, all right, for a practice. Um, so very simply to do any type of conversion, you know, you may have a, a tank, garbage tank that has a, a pressure of 4,200 PSI. We want to convert that to pore, atmosphere, and uh, millimeters of merc. Well, we can do it all as follows. Because recall, we have all these conversion factors. One, it, Atmosphere equal to 760, or we could say 760 tor is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, or we can that could be equal to 14.7 psi. So we have a number of them, conversion factors, and we can just set it up such that the units, again, using dimensional analysis, keeping track of the units, set them up so the units cancel out and leaving us with the units that we're looking for. And in the first one, you can see. If we start off with uh, uh, 4,200 PSI, we know that in one atmosphere is equal to 14.7 PSI. 
but we set it up with a PSI to cancel out, leaving us with atmosphere, okay? Because we're asking to we we're asking to convert this value before atmosphere and millimeters of mercury. All right, so that tells us that that is equal to 3.0 times 10 to the second power of atmosphere. Okay. Um, going from um, PSI to TOR, we know that the 760 TOR is equal to 14.7 PSI. Again, we set it up so the PSI is canceled, leaving us with TOR. Right. So that is equivalent to 203. Thousand tor, and then finally, because uh, one tor is equal to one millimeter mercury, it's a straightforward. It's not, we don't even need a conversion factor. We just change the units there. Okay, so that's a conversion factor of pressure. All right. Well, let's figure out the let's let's talk about the relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature with respect to gases. We know that if the volume increases, what do you think would happen to the pressure? If you have a container, and uh, you have X amount of of matter, air. In other words, let's look at it this way. Let's take let's take your your car tire. It has a 32 PSI right now, okay? So it has an X amount of uh, air in your tire to give you the 32 PSI. Now, let's take all that air that you have in your tire and pull it out. We can pull out with a vacuum and then transfer it over to a tire that belongs to a, I don't know, 18 wheeler truck, okay? What do you think the the pressure would happen. What would be the new pressure? Yeah, it would decrease. Yeah, it'd be a flat tire on the 18 wheeler, right? Okay, so that, that that's the relationship. That's the relationship is that as the volume increases, okay, the pressure decreases, keeping the amount of matter inside constant. Now, what about the temperature? What do you think, you know, using the analogy of, of the tire after you drove on it for about an hour, what do you think the pressure would happen? Wouldn't that go up? It sure does. Okay, again, because if you heat, the, heat that container up, you, that energy is transferred to the molecules and they get excited and they start Banging up against the wall. Remember uh, that pressure is a is a measure per, of uh, per unit area. Okay. And then, obviously, if the gas molecules increases, what do you think happens to the pressure? You got a low tire. What do you do? You go to quick trip. You put more gas molecules in there. What happens to your pressure? It goes up, right? Yeah, because you're adding more matter into the container into whatever container this gas is in, in this case, the tire. And so when we talk, we talk about relationships, whether it's direct or indirect, what we mean is if, if one variable increases, the other variable increases accordingly. And that's a direct relationship. An indirect relationship is this, when one variable increases, the other variable decreases. That is an indirect or inversely proportional Okay, so what can we say about pressure and volume? That is an indirect relationship. That is the pressure and volume. When one goes up, the other goes down and vice versa, okay? So you notice up here, number one, volume increases. What happens? Pressure decreases, okay? Pressure and temperature. That would be a direct. Notice what happened here. When the pressure, let me highlight these so you can make sure we understand. Notice that when we increase the volume, pressure decreased. That's the indirect relationship. When we increase the temperature, the pressure increased. One variable goes up, the next one goes up accordingly. That would be a direct relationship. Okay. 
And also number three, as we increase the atoms, quantity of atoms, the pressure increases. So that also is a direct relationship. All right. So what that means is this. We have what is called uh, a, a combined gas law. Now, um, how can I state this? All right, how does this come about? And notice the notice the relationship we we determined back here, indirect. When pressure goes up, volume drops. Okay. Now, how do we write that in an equation? Here's 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 the thing. When we observe that, that type of relationship, when we're talking about volume and, and pressure, we can say that pressure is equal to the inverse of volume, okay? That's the relationship that we observe. Now, the cool thing about this is this, that if I take a lot of measurements, by um, pressure and volume, I can come up with a constant, which I would now put right there. There's a K constant. So my equation now becomes P is equal to K, which is some constant divided by volume. Now, after I collect a lot of pressure and volume data, I can rearrange this equation. So now I have PV is equal to K. K is a constant value. Now, under certain conditions, under, say, initial conditions, I would have this relationship where I got PV, P1, and PV1 is equal to some K. If I have a different set of conditions, I have a second set of conditions, which this it's the same K because it's constant, same material, but I got two different set of, I get the first pressure and the first volume. Then what I do is I do another set of conditions where I got a second pressure and a second volume. Now, that K is constant in both conditions because I haven't changed anything. It's the same uh, gas and everything in the container. But that being the case, since K is equal to K, I can put these two equations together and end up with this relationship. P1 times V1 is equal to P2 times V2, which is stating that the one is the initial conditions and two is the final conditions, okay? And that is what we call what Boyle came about. That's what he did with his equation. He recognized that the initial relationship was that pressure was inversely proportional to volume and by putting a k there in you there's a there's a constant between the two that's product the product of the pressure and the volume is equal to some constant regardless of the conditions that you put in so the first set of conditions versus the second second set of conditions that k is still the same that being the case i can equate that to be p1 times v1 is equal to p2 uh, and V2, where one and two represent two, the first initial set and two represents the final set. What this does is this. Now you have four variables. And if you know three of those variables, you can solve for the fourth variable, okay? That's, a, that's the cool thing about this. Now notice here, temperature is not involved. So what Boyle did, he did his, his testing, his experiments by holding the temperature constant. And so by holding the temperature constant, he only had to deal with pressure and volume, okay? Now, another scientist came along. And, you know, you can do this if... It, 
just come up with your equation by, you know, uh, looking, observing whatever variables you're measuring. And you could come up with an equation to predict and to uh, describe what you observe. Okay. And so Charles Law came along. Okay. And he came up with his relationship. And guess what? What do you think he, what, what variable? There's three variables, pressure, volume, and temperature. What do you think old Charlie did here? What variable did he hold constant? That would be pressure. He held that constant. Okay? Because we know that under the uh, first set of conditions um, that, remember the volume was directly proportional to temperature, right? We said that volume was equal to temperature. And we can put a K there to give us an equation and then define it as V1 and V2. Well, under a second set of conditions, it's the same K under just separate conditions. We arrange v, uh, this, we get V2 over T2 is equal to K. And over here, V1 is equal to T1 is equal to K. Both Ks are constant, guess what? We end up with Charles Law, okay? And Charles Law, relates the relationship of volume and temperature while the pressure is held constant. All right, let's erase this a little bit. Then we got one more in Gay-Lussac's law. Well, guess what they did? They did a series of experiments and they held volume constant. Because volume being held constant, you know it's it's temper its volume is constant, it's not gonna change. You can you can ignore that variable. Okay. The same is true with pressure constant and temperature constant. So you only have to hold measure pressure and temperature when you hold the volume constant. And so basically we have three laws here, Boyle's law, Charles law, and Gay-Lussac's law. They're all very similar, okay? And, uh, but what the, each one did was hold one of the three variables constant, okay? Now, we can combine these laws, okay? We can combine them because we know that, um, uh, we can put P1, V1, okay, divided by T1 is equal to P2, V2 divided by T2. Remember, one and two, one represents the initial conditions, two represents the final conditions. So we have four equations here that we can utilize. And when uh, one, of, if the word problem does not mention one of the variables, then you can assume that it is held constant. In other words, all those three equations, Boyle's, Charles Law, and Gay-Lussac's Gay Law, are all tied in to the combined gas law. All right, so if you keep this in mind, that one, combined gas law, and you look at the question, and if the question says, does not refer to the temperature or tells you the temperature is constant, but guess what? If the temperature is constant, T1 and T2 cancel. They cancel out because it's the same value. And you end up with Boyle's law. P1, V1 is equal to P2, V1. And if the volume is constant, the same scenario. Volume is constant, then you've got gay lussac law. And so on, so, so forth and so on. Okay? Now, also, uh, they will give you the temperature. Or they may say STP. Remember, STP are zero degrees and uh, one atmosphere and zero degrees Celsius. The, the, the word problem could mention, you know, the final conditions are STP conditions, or you start at STP conditions and you get to some other conditions, okay? 
So the key to these problems here is to recognize the initial con conditions with respect to pressure, volume, and temperature versus the final conditions with respect to pressure, volume, temperature, okay? We have a total of six variables. You're, on, you're, gonna, you're gonna have five of them. You solve for the sixth one, okay? All right, let me clear this up. Okay, now recall back when we're doing factors, for these equations to function properly, to give you the right number, just make sure that your temperature is in Kelvin, okay? That's the only stipulation. Temperature must be in Kelvin if the temperature is part of the calculation. Now the volumes, now you can notice there in the combined gas law, you know, if you're going to be solving for P2, you're going to move P, V1, V2 and T2 over to the left-hand side of the equation. You know, if you want those to cancel properly, make sure you, they're in the same units. So volume, for example, you don't want the initial volume to be millimeters and the final to be in liters. So uh, pick one volume unit or the other, millimeters or, um, or liters. The, it still be... The ratios to be the same, they just make sure they're, they're in the correct same units to cancel out, okay? The same is true with pressure. You don't want to be tor on one side and atmosphere on the other side, all right? And then uh, identify all the variables, the initial variables and the final variables, and then solve for the variable that is missing, okay? Now, uh, using the combined gas law, if the word problem does not mention either temperature, volume, or, or, or pressure, then you can assume that they're held constant. You can eliminate those two variables, okay? Or the word problem may tell you one of these is constant. So that simplifies the uh, combined gas law equation. And then simply plug in and solve, solve for the uh, the uh, uh, variable that that is missing. For example, a sample of carbon dioxide gas occupies 2.25 liters at 758 torr. Find the volume if the pressure is decreased to 698. Okay, so. Let's first write the combined gas law, okay? P1, B1 divided by T1 is equal to P2, V2 divided by T2, right? Uh, hold on a second. All right, so you see that there's the sample gets find the final volume. And so obviously they're looking, we're looking for the final volume, which is V2. Okay, notice there's no mention of temperature there, any place, right? And we're just talking about pressure and volume. And so temperature factors can be removed. And so we simply got P1, V1 is equal to P2 times T1. So we got to solve for V2. So we got P1, V1 divided by P2 is equal to V2 is what we want the final volume, okay? Identify the initial. The sample of carbon dioxide occupies 2.2 liters at 758 torr. And so initially, it is at uh, 758.4, right? And at 2.25 liters. And then it's decreased to 698 torr. That would be two, uh, P2, 698 torr. Okay. Notice that the torrs cancel leaving me volumes, which is what we're looking for. So now you plug and play the, the numbers and you calculate what V2 is, okay? All 
Let me let me check. So here we got that. Plug in the numbers. So our final volume is 2.44 liters. Okay. A sample of krypton gas occupies 391 liters at 105C. Find the temperature in Celsius of the gas if the volume is changed to 6.05 liters. No, no mention about pressure here, so we can assume that is constant. Second, the temperature is given in Celsius, so we need to convert that to Kelvin by adding 273. So our answer would be given to us in Kelvin, but then we need to convert it back to Celsius because they're asking the question, what is the temperature in Celsius, okay? But the calculations must be done in Kelvin first. So plug it in. And so we set that up, set that problem up. V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. We are solving for the final temperature. Okay. So we plug in the numbers 605 liters times 378 Kelvin. That is 105 plus. 273, and we divided by uh, 391, okay? Because that's their initial volume. Our final volume is 605 liters. Our initial temperature is 378 Kelvin, and our final volume, our initial volume is 391 liters, okay? And so, um, Doing the math, we end up with 585 Kelvin, subtract 273 to get us back into Celsius. So the temperature now is at 312 degrees Kelvin. Okay. All right. Uh, all right, so here we go. A, fine, a steel container filled with nitrous oxide at 15 atmospheres is cooled from 25.5 degrees Celsius to negative 40.82 Celsius. Calculate the final pressure. Okay. And so here, volume is held constant. Because this container is it's a steel container. We didn't do anything to the volume, it's how constant. All we're doing is reducing the temperature. The, the container starts off at 15 atmosphere and we reduce the pressure, the temperature. Okay, which is in Celsius, but we need to convert it to Kelvin. And so we take uh, 232. T2 is 232.2 Kelvin, which is negative 40.8 Celsius. So negative 40.8 Celsius plus 273 gives you 232.2 Kelvin. Okay. And then we divide that by 298.5 Kelvin, which is the initial temperature of 25.5 Celsius. And so our final pressure is 11.7 atmosphere, which makes sense if you think about it. If you were to take a balloon, regular balloon, blow it up, and it would have an X amount of volume, you can see it there, and then stick that balloon in the freezer, let it sit there for a couple hours, then take it out. You would notice that balloon will, <laughs> will have shrunk, you know, uh, because the pressure, the molecules get closer together and the pressure will drop pressure drops and then the volume decreased. But uh, just trying to visualize why you get a lower pressure. All right, nitrogen, another example. Nitrogen has a gas sample occupies 550.50 milliliters at negative 82.8 Celsius and is at uh, 1250 torr. What is the volume at STP? Ah, okay, a little bit different here. 
Okay. What is the volume at STP? So we know that is this is zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. So we have a choice here as far as pressure, because this pressure is 1254 and STP is one atmosphere. We can either uh, convert the tor to atmosphere or the atmosphere to tor, whichever suits your fancy. Remember, we keep the units the same regardless of what the units are. As long as they're the same, we're good. Temperature gets converted to Kelvin, okay? And then uh, the volume, well, we can keep it there in milliliters, don't have to be liters, because our answer would be in, in uh, milliliters if we hold that constant. All right, so this is V1, okay? P1, temperature, and P1, okay? This means this is T2 and P2. We're looking for V2. But making sure that we keep our temperatures in Kelvin and that our units are the same with respect to the other variables. Okay, so in this case, we use the uh, combined gas law. So we have all the variables here. Here, let me just clear that up. We use this P1 times V1 divided by T2 is equal to P2 times V2 divided by T2. We are solving for V2, which is the final volume. Okay. I earlier I, I uh, identified all the variables. Okay, and we need to convert the units, in this case, the tor, the one atmosphere ST, um, STP pressure was one atmosphere, right? Which is simply 760 tor. So we can simply add 760 tor rather than change the tor to atmosphere. It's just much easier to change one atmosphere to tor. And then we uh, keep the units in millimeters, that's fine. And then our our temperatures are are uh, changed to Kelvin. Remember zero degrees zero degrees STP is two seventy three Kelvin. Simply add two seventy three. Negative eighty two point eight. Well, add two seventy three to that. You get one hundred ninety point nine, one hundred ninety point two Kelvin. Therefore, our final volume would have a Final volume would be 190 milliliters at STP. Okay, so that that is this is the example of using the combined gas law. These are all the the the, the gas laws put together. You got three variables and so forth. Moles are not involved here. Okay. But we have what's called the ideal gas law. And that law is, is product PV is equal to NRT, okay? Pressure, uh, make sure it's in, unit, in the units of atmosphere. And I'll explain why they have to be in specific units. And that's related to R. R is a constant. And that constant has specific units. So we're going to use a specific constant. The, the units in the constant can vary, and that they do, then you got to make sure all the other variables uh, change accordingly. So, and they can be confusing. So, the point is use this constant, use these units, and you're good to go. So, keep pressure in atmosphere. Okay. Volume, you keep it in liters. Okay. N is the number of moles. So, what does that tell you? To calculate moles, you need the molar mass, all right? So, because you're gonna take whatever grams of material divided by the molar mass to give you moles, all right? This is the constant, R. And it has the units of liters atmosphere per mole Kelvin. And that's why those units and pressure and volume have to be kept there. And that value is 0 0.08, 
0.206 liters atmosphere per mole Kelvin is a constant. Okay. And temperature, as always, all these gas laws is uh, in temperature, in um, Kelvin, excuse me. So, <laughs> using the combined gas, that's where the confusion may fit, may sit sometimes. When you're dealing with a particular gas and you are just changing the conditions, pressure, volume, and temperature, then you use the combined gas law, okay? As shown there, PVT is equal to P PVT second conditions. When you're given variables of a gas and you want to find out specific variables of a gas, you use the ideal gas law, okay, to find out the variables about a gas, not about the changes that that gas may undergo, okay? Um, right, for example, what is the volume of a gas? If the pressure is 3.56 atmosphere, the temperature is 25.6 C, and there are 32.35 grams of carbon monoxide present, okay? I'm trying to determine the um, volume. And so first we need to change the temperature to Kelvin. So 25.6 plus 273 Kelvin. Then we um, take the pressure is okay. We're in atmosphere, okay? And then we need to convert the grams of carbon monoxide to moles. And so we got 33.35 grams divided by 28.01. 28.01 is the molar mass of carbon monoxide. One carbon, one oxygen. That's 28.01. So we end up with 1.190646. Don't truncate the numbers yet till you're done at the end. Okay, so that's number of moles. And now we just plug it in, okay? Because what we're looking for is V. So V is equal to NRT divided by pressure, okay? And so plug in the numbers as so, solve for V. That's the gas constant, 0 0.08206 with the units of liters, atmosphere, moles per Kelvin. Notice all of these units will cancel out, leaving us with liters, okay? So solve for V. And once you do that, you get, an answer of 8.20 liters. So at 25.6 degrees Celsius and at 3.56 atmosphere pressure, this is a little bit, almost four times the atmospheric pressure. And if you have 32.35 grams of carbon monoxide, it will have a volume of 8.20 8.20 liters, okay? Unlike STP, if we were in STP conditions, we know automatically it'll have a volume of 22.4 liters, right, for one mole, okay? But here with this, you can uh, determine the volume um, for uh, any, any, any gas. All right. Um, that's all about the uh, gas laws that we have for you. I just want to add a little side note about the next calculation about gases that are going into our atmosphere. Back in the 80s when I was in, uh, in graduate school, uh, we one of the requirements was um, for us to, one of the classes for every graduate student was to be able to present a talk about a particular publication on the spur of the moment. So every week we went to this class. So that kept us and trained us to learn to keep up with the literature and read about it and be ready to prepare and present something. Well, what caught our attention at the time is one fellow graduate student presented a 
publication that was at the time, I, I, want, I don't want to say, I want to say hilarious. It, it was uh, because it was not done before. It was crazy when the idea of it was just, and we couldn't fathom it as how ignorant we were of the situation. And I don't recall the exact title, but this uh, these group of scientists had had studied. Uh, it was labeled something about the fluctuation of bovines, basically the emission of gases into the air based on cows. Okay, because they do have a lot of methane gas and other gases. Okay, and so at first we were kidding about it, but then we started doing numbers. And we're like, whoa, okay, because these gases go into the atmosphere. And if they're not taken care of, they stay there. And they don't go anyplace. They won't leave our orbit, you know, and where they go is they act as a blanket and resulting in all kinds of environmental issues. Uh, much like your vehicle is when you're nice and cool and you come out mid morning, mid afternoon, and you open that door and it's pretty hot, right? Because your 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 mirror, your glass is acting as a blanket. So whatever heat it absorbs, it's not going out because uh, these gases get in the atmosphere and um, they they cause the heat that normally would have gone out to space and dissipated to come back onto Earth. So anyway, I want to give you some numbers to think about, okay? And let's assume conservatively, conservatively that, and this is just cows because we're just, you know, I don't want to pick on cows, but that's just, that's what the, the publication was. Bear in mind, this was back in the 80s. So let's conservatively say that a cow emits, say, 10 liters of gas per hour, okay? That's very conservative. Now, yeah, there's a question. Yeah, that's quite a bit, actually. And that's not being conservative, you know, with leaders, because a lot of them, you know, much less and so forth. But let's let's just take that one cow at 10 liters at 24 hours, 365 days per year. That's about 87,000 liters of gas per year per cow. Now, numbers fluctuate some people numbers claim there's about 19 billion cows worldwide that can vary but you know and let's assume there's 19 billion take that number multiply it by that you end up with a lot of volume of gas going up there give you an idea of this number uh that would take almost oh what over 600 million Olympic site pools to, to measure. So that's a lot of stuff. And it's up there, methane. And we got to find a way to, to reduce it and or get it out of the atmosphere, utilize it. You know, it's, a lot of the cows do emit methane, which is a fuel that we could utilize. However, remember your, your combustion reaction. When you combust a reaction, what are you producing? Carbon dioxide, another gas, all right? So it's a difficult problem. I just thought I'd throw that number up there. And that's being conservative. You can even reduce that, you know, you, know, you think 10 liters, that's, you know, five two liter bottles, you know, or even cut it by, cut it by half. That number's still humongous, okay? Anyway, food for thought, give you an idea. That, ladies and gentlemen, you are done with chemistry. <laughs> we have gone through 16 chapters in eight weeks. That's pretty intense for the summer. Uh, um, and uh, it did go by quick. It did go by very quick. It's normally about right now, we're probably about in the regular semester, we're close to like midterm. Yeah. And normally we don't meet as often. Uh, I know my GCC classes, I meet an hour 15 twice a week. And we have, uh, they have one lab once a week, you know, so it is spread out quite a bit. So what this, what this means is this, that we will have, and I'll send an email to this effect. 
So come Tuesday, because officially the semester doesn't end till Thursday. So come Tuesday and Thursday, I will be here on Zoom. I'll hang around for about an hour. If no one shows up, I'll, you know, I'll just go ahead and shut her down. But uh, this is your time uh, for if you have any questions, feel free to bring them up. We can go over them. Any clarification of any of the problems we can do, you know, so this is basically your time. So that'll be that'll be true for Tuesday and Thursday. Okay.